Hello, CohaCon 2020. I'm Lizette Shear from the Latah County Library District, headquartered in Moscow, Idaho. Today, I'm going to talk about our consortium, Valnet, some of the problems we face, and our current solutions to those problems. All the code snippets that I'll show or talk about during this presentation will be available at github.com slash Lizette Shear slash CohaCon 2020. There will be two folders, one for jQuery snippets and one for SQL. First, a little about Valnet. Valnet had its origins in 1983, when libraries in the Lewis and Clark Valley formed the Le Valley Library Consortium. Staff from member libraries met regularly to brainstorm on ways to share materials. This group became the Valley Automated Library Network, Valnet for short, and introduced its first shared catalog and courier system in 1988. The organization is now known simply as Valnet. The Valley discussed in earlier versions of the name, is here the Lewis and Clark Valley, which houses the towns of Lewis and Idaho and Clarkston, Washington. The goal of Valnet is to share resources among all member libraries for the benefit of patrons at all those libraries. We have a shared catalog and courier, and any Valnet patron can obtain and use a Valnet card at any location, although public schools only issue cards to faculty and students. All our libraries must agree to share all their materials, with some exceptions for specialty and staff collections. It is 170 miles to drive from our furthest south branch, Elk City, to our furthest north branch, Potlatch. On the right side of the screen, these are the cards our patrons can choose from when creating a card. There are three main problems our consortium faces today. First, we have many libraries and districts that each have their own needs. Some of these needs are imposed by outside governing entities, such as a school district or a city library, such as Lewiston City Library. Some of these needs are imposed by an internal board, such as the Cograngeville Library and the Latah County Library District. Second, we have a mix of libraries and districts, such as Latah County Library District and the Prairie River Library District and standalone libraries such as Lewiston and Elk City. There are different needs for multi-branch systems versus standalone branches within the consortium. Finally, there are the different needs of school libraries and public libraries. Schools have different needs for their patrons and collections. I'm going to break down some of the specific instances for each set of problems, as well as some of our solutions. The first problem we face is many libraries with many needs. What are some of the different needs in Valnet? To fine or not to fine? That is the question. Most of our school libraries never charged fines because of the school's requirements surrounding taking money from students. Last year, the boards of various Valnet libraries began the process of deciding if and when to go fine free. Most of the libraries in the consortium went fine free by February, except for Latah County and Grangeville Public. Latah County had planned to go fine free at the end of March, but the shutdown to the state of Idaho due to COVID-19 changed our timeline. Instead, we went fine free once we closed and started advertising after we reopened in June. We extended all our due dates, first with help from Bywater, then with the awesome new tool, until right before we reopened, so there were no fines at that point. Currently, Grangeville is the only library that is still collecting fines on their materials. This problem ties in with the next problem, differing circulation periods. When Valnet formed, and as new libraries have joined, we've allowed everyone to keep their own circulation rules. This can cause problems for both our patrons and our staff in a few ways. Patrons sometimes get confused because their items all have different due dates. Also, if they get an item that has fines, it can cause confusion, since our branch no longer collects or charges late fines. It can also be confusing for staff, both when setting and updating the rules in the circ and fine rules table, as well as when checking out items with different due dates and sometimes when placing holds on items at libraries that allow a different number of holds than your home branch. Another problem we run into is the different libraries needs on the purchase suggestion page. Some branches don't want to do online purchase suggestions at all, while others want to have different notes and requirements for their patron suggestions. So how do we solve each of these problems? Well, the first two tie in together. 
Since each library has their own circ rules, we can't just set all the fines to zero at branches that have no fines. Now that our patrons never get fines, no matter where the item comes from. There has been some talk about standardizing the rules, but since these libraries have different needs, that might not work out anytime soon. For now, other libraries write off Grangeville fines when they come in for our patrons. Before the libraries that did go fine free went fine free, we would each keep the fines that were collected at our branches, rather than send money through the courier. So now we're all writing off Grangeville fines because we would have been collecting the money for ourselves and trying to figure out a good solution so that they don't, Grangeville doesn't lose too much revenue from this change. But patrons at fine free libraries also don't have to pay to the one library. If our circuit fine rules were standardized, we could more easily do that. For the purchase suggestion differences, I have a few bits of jQuery to show off today. Big thanks to Lucas at Bywater, who helped me when I've hit roadblocks, and also to George Williams, who set up some of the code that we'll be talking about today when he was in my position. First, I'm going to talk about a couple of changes to the staff client purchase suggestion screen. This code would need to be entered into the intranet user JS. This chunk of JQ is used for a number of uses on the staff client, such as formatting some shelving locations on the check-in screen, automatically populating a patron attribute only Latah County uses, and this purchase suggestion code. It is used to identify certain staff patrons as LCLD staff by checking if their username contains certain strings, in this case, Moss for the Moscow Public Library. If so, so this checks if their username contains Moss, and if it does, it gives them the attribute LCLD staff. Then, if the logged in username has the attribute of LCLD staff, we can do some more. My focus right now is on the purchase suggestion page. For Laytaw County Library staff, we had a line to before the notes field that says, please ask patron if they would like interlibrary loan if not purchased by the library. And put ILL yes or ILL no in the field. Also, please initial. Not every library in the consortium does interlibrary loan. So we don't want to add that to every staff's purchase suggestion page because it might be confusing. Also, not all the libraries that use interlibrary loan use the same process as Latah County. Latah County, if the item isn't purchased and it fits within our parameters for interlibrary loan, we will send it, to s send it along to our interlibrary loan staff. Throughout Foundnet, we use shared staff logins at the circulation desk. Each branch has a branch code circ account. For example, Moss Circ. Since we have shared logins, we also want to make sure staff are initially in the purchase suggestions, so if we have follow up questions for the staff member, we know who to ask. Here is what this note looks like for staff. This next section is a little more complicated. First, I'm going to highlight a couple of system-wide changes I made so my examples make sense. Then I'll show you the code and examples for our setups. Um, this is all on the patron side. And in the OPAC user JS, we've changed the labels for adult to author slash key actors and to collection title to youth or adult item. This more closely matches how our consortium uses the purchase suggestion form. We've also hidden the publication place, quantity, publisher, and standard number from the patron screen. I am looking forward to bug 23420 being pushed, which is currently in past QA. That way I'll be able to take some of this code out. Here's what the edited form looks like currently. Now for the branch specific options. This also goes in the same OPAC user JS. First, we set up to hide the form as the default by assigning the class form hide to the form. Then for each branch that wants a custom text block at the top of the suggestion page, we prepend a div for that branch or district and make it hidden, then populate it with the information that we want. So at the start of the form, we'll prepend a div for LATA that's hidden with the information we want. And you can put any kind of HTML in there. So we put a link to our website. 
Since patrons have logged in branch stored on the page, we can do some slick customization per branch. I start with setting a variable with the logged in username's branch code. This will let us set the patron's page based up on their logged in library. So we say document ready function, let the logged in branch variable equal the logged in username attribute data branch code. Then, for each branch that wants the purchase suggestion page turned on, you need to unhide the form and any custom information. So, if the logged in branch is equal to Beauville, a Lataw County branch, we can remove the hidden attribute from both Lataw and remove the, dit, the class from the form. You can also do other customization options, such as hiding additional fields or adding more notes to fields specific to a branch or system. Currently, we don't have a need for that, but I have tested it. And you would just put it in between these, uh, like a, after this form hide, but before this bracket. At the end, you'll need to do an else and replace the form span with something like this. So else, div span replace with, your library does not currently accept online purchase suggestions. Please contact your local branch for more information. You could also use this code without the hiding of the form to just customize the form and not hide things, in which case instead of hiding, you would just leave that part out and then you wouldn't need to do an else at the bottom or remove the hidden class from the form. Here's what the form looks like when a library has it turned off. No form, just this text. There is a bug for custom text for the top of each branch using the news feature, and that's bug 26630. The second problem we face is having a mix of district and standalone libraries. One problem that staff of districts within a consortium face is the changing of settings. For things like the circ and fine rules, as well as holidays on the calendar, it can be a headache to copy those changes to each branch. There is a bug for setting circ and fine rules by group 16207. So, hopefully one day we will have that. For calendars, we have jQuery that keeps the copy to all libraries button hidden. So, for example, a school doesn't accidentally close all the libraries in the consortium when closing their school district for the summer. This is the code that we use for that. And then we can just go in and comment this code out if we do need to add a a consortium-wide holiday, like when we closed everything for COVID, we did that. The hierarchical groups feature in Koha made it easy to write reports where you can specify different groups of reports needing by using the drop down, a drop-down menu. I have SQL snippets in the repository I linked at the start of the presentation for how to set up the drop-downs and how to set reports to show the description of the home library instead of the so this is my example of how we add in library groups as a drop down to a report so on this one you'll have to make sure to call left join the library groups uh, on in this example it's items owned by libraries in a group a shelf list so this way I can do items home branch equals library groups branch code and then the library groups parent ID will equal groups type groups, and that will give us a drop down when we go to run the report, where we can pick one of the groups. And then that'll give us just the ones with home branch, it has a parent ID that matches for Lataw County Library District. So then for this example, we'll show library groups. This is the, it'll show the description or title, whichever way you want to do it, rather than just the ID. But you do have to call the library groups table twice. So how you do that is you would call the library groups and then give it an alias. In this case, I did LG parent and then left join library groups with a different alias LG child on the parent LG parent ID is going to equal the LG child parent ID field. Confusing, I know. Um, and then that way you can get the parent title or description um, 
for each branch name and branch. That's what this report example is. And so that can be helpful, especially if you're running a report that maybe has multiple, you're not like limiting on the group necessarily, but you are wanting to see which group they're in, maybe for sorting purposes. Purchase suggestion collection development works a little differently for library districts versus standalone libraries in Koha. Because uh, the library puts everything into one branch, it's uh, our purchasers our purchasers have to look at seven separate branches for items to check. So instead, we've done something a little different. Our district has two purchasers, one for adult materials and one for youth materials. The branches also have a small paperback budget for but the bulk of the collection purchasing is done via the youth and adult services librarians. To make the process of using these suggestions easier for them, we've set up suggest status, that's an authorized value, options that are specific to our county. Then each purchaser has a link to LCLD send to adult or LCLD send to youth for all libraries. This is what the suggestions management page looks like now. To help with keeping the tabs from cluttering the other librarian's screen, I've written some jQuery that hides those tabs if the staff member does not have the LCLD staff attribute from the earlier code. I added this to the end of the section where I define Latah County specific code. Since the section starts with an if and there isn't an else at the end, I can add an else statement at the end that affects all non-LCLD staff. So for each of those tabs, I said else the suggestion, well, I said else, and then I did for each suggestion tab name, it says it has a line like this, and it's all within this bracket. And so with all of those, these are the only ones that show. We use declined instead of rejected consortium wide, but occasionally one still adds up, ends up in with in rejected, so we like to have that visible. This way, other consortium staff gets a nice cleaned up set of tabs. There are a couple bugs related to these. Bug 26649, authorized value suggests status doesn't currently respect branch limitation, so it shows up for everybody whether they're at that branch or not. And bug 21328, which is for viewing purchase suggestions via hierarchical group rather than having that as an option instead of only having by branch as an option. With most of our libraries now going fine free, the main differences in the school library's needs and the public library's needs is the need for summer closures for the schools. If the branches were all closing for the same dates, we could use the calendar and some system preferences to lock everything down, which we did when all the branches closed for a few months during COVID, or very number of months, but at the start we were all closed. And each school has different schedules, and here's what we have to do for each branch. Set hard due dates, calendar closures, turn off pickup location, add news to the OPAC, and hide those branches items from the OPAC, as well as changing rules so holds can't be placed. Then we have to undo each of these steps when we're ready to reopen. For each school branch, we have this set of code in the OPAC user JS field that disables, so in the OPAC user JS, the option, it, that's the branch code value, we make it disabled and append that it's closed for the summer. So then each option won't be pickable and will show that it's closed for the summer. If the patron has a home library from one of those branches, they'll get an alert that their home branch is closed for the summer and the JS will unselect the option. So if whichever branch selected value is ash, which is the library that's closed, then you get an alert that your home branch is closed for the summer, please select a different pickup location, and unselects that branch. We do this instead of shutting them off as pickup locations because we want to know patron want patrons to know why they can't pick up at their regular home library. Bug 12450 suggests adding 
an interface that would allow you to set all the options in one place with a start and end date to more easily facilitate closures. Of this would be helpful both for school library closures as well as closures for remodels or extenuating circumstances such as the COVID-19 closures. Thank you so much for attending my presentation. You can email me at lizettes at latallibrary.org if you have any questions. I'm also on Twitter at Lizette Shear. Our Valnet catalog is available at valnet.org and you can find me in the IRC as Lizette Lata. I've also listed the bugs I referenced down on the bottom of the slide. I should be joining you shortly for a live Q&A. Thanks everyone!